Right, the RSS podcast is back. We are the only feed you need. And today we have a very, very special guest, Mr. Tyler Pope. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank How's you. How's it going, man? You good? Happy Happy, happy New Year. Happy 2023. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, same to you. Happy 2023. And uh, yeah, how are you, how you feeling for the, for the year ahead? Um... Yeah, it's going to be a busy one. It's going to be a busy year for um for for me and for my label and for um you know, family. I got all kinds of stuff on my plate and it's all going full. It's, it's like going up a up a gear, up a notch. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. it's kind of like yeah, cross our uh cross town traffic. <laughs> yeah that's that that's type of vibe that type of vibe right in the middle exactly. <laughs> cool man so look i think um we've probably got a lot to discuss in various mm. different areas um obviously we've been, been wanting to get you on for ages and obviously haven't worked on a few projects a few things we can we can discuss in that realm but yeah i mean you know the, the, the typical way that you know you're obviously uh, you know got an absolutely iconic music career um and obviously having launched your own your own label in the last few years as well like um it's always super super interesting to me and to the audience to like i guess understand the journey it's very different for everybody sure um everyone has their own vantage points etc so the the in in true rss podcast style uh the kickoff question um is like what's what would you say is your your earliest like recollection or I don't know like connection connection with music? Um, yeah, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah. Okay. So probably it was very very um, long ago. You know, when I was ten years old, maybe earlier, nine years old, and my parents just had a two a guitar with two strings on it like laying around the house. I don't know where they got it. It was just kind of like a total junk piece of junk. And I just like, I I loved playing this thing with two strings only, you know, like I, I really loved it though. And, um, and I made up, you know, I even made up some songs. I remember, you know, like it was like, I, yeah, I, yeah, I don't even know. I, just the innocence, you know, of just like picking up something and not knowing what, to do with it you know it's like <clears throat> wrote a couple songs so that was probably like yeah when I was like nine about nine years old I guess and then literally from there on since then I've been in it like active in music which is kind of crazy you yeah, know like every day <laughs> I mean that yeah that's that's amazing like yeah. you, know, you know span spans a great amount of time um and obviously you accomplished a lot in that time too like yeah. when you were when you were um when you sort of picked up the guitar and sort of first found your your love with it or whatnot um what what music were you listening to at the time or if you weren't like actively listening do you remember what music was around you at the time whether it was Absolutely. family tv and all that sort of stuff yeah man well mtv was really big then that was like kind of you know and they actually played music videos all the time it was um before any of the like mtv show stuff you know this was like late 80s so i fell very much into the demographic that they were shooting for with uh with guns and roses got it first first love so <laughs> Shout it's, not, Axel. it's a little embarrassing it could be worse <laughs> <laughs> but i got i gotta say that was the thing that um made me probably ask my parents like i want to get guitar lessons Amazing. Uh, and so yeah guns and roses very formative nice and and yeah i mean actually you kind of just touched on it then but the one thing i was gonna gonna ask is like how it went from picking up that guitar to then evolving to more of a fully fledged thing so like you, you said you obviously asked for lessons was that very soon after and think, like what yeah. what setting did that kind of you know unfold Honestly, yeah yeah it was i mean what how old are you when you're in your last of of you know ele elementary school sixth grade I think I was like I must have been 10 it was the, la the last year of elementary school in the United States it was like sixth grade um where you know we all kind of started to pay attention to the bands and music and you know what you do at that age 
Um, so that's when I, um, that's when I really like, yeah, I decided like, oh yeah, you know, I love doing this and I'm actually kind of naturally gifted in a way. So I asked my parents if I could, you know, yeah, have the guitar lessons and, and yeah, they agreed to do it. And it was pretty, they were pretty supportive with the guitar lessons for sure. You know, they were imagining that I was going to be playing like classical guitar with like, you know, finger picking. <laughs> yeah, like fiddling <laughs> like, away. Yeah, exactly. Like green oh. sleeves, you know, at, at Christmas or whatever. Um, but like <laughs> little, little did they know. Little, little did, they, did know. they know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll be, yeah, you'll be pack, packing out arenas and uh, sending people wild. I know playing one note, just do, 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 you know. <laughs> 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 amazing yeah like from from the from the lessons then like I guess how yeah how, how did it how did it, how did the sort of love of music and and the guitar and I mean because you you predominantly known correct me if I'm wrong for playing bass for LCD yeah um like to my ignorance obviously I know there's a difference between the guitar and the bass guitar sure. um strings notes etc um but I guess yeah how did it evolve from the lessons into then you know at what point did you hone in on the bass was it much later or yeah to talk around that a little bit yeah so um it was like I, I actually I started with guitar but my strong like my naturally strong point in music has always been feeling and rhythm mm -hmm. you know, I've always been really able to like just have like it's just a weird thing with you know bass or with drums instruments that are really simple but just like the way you play them is a big part of it um and I always got I always like felt like I had a good feeling so I kind of I I felt like I, I just naturally fit with bass even though I started with guitar and actually just kind of bass just felt better for me mm -hmm. um naturally I think from the beginning on, on one hand and then the other hand was that I think I joined a band that needed a bass just needed a bass player so um I just was like yeah that was that was that um and I just you know kind of started playing it more seriously then that was probably that was also very early like when I was like 14 15 years old I started that's when I for, for, for the first time really like switched over to bass also was really influenced by um at the time, early '90s, um, there was like you know the punk, the funk punk movement, not the punk funk, but like the funk punk <laughs> movement. <laughs> Very different. Yeah. Uh, um, like Primus and Infectious Grooves, and there was a lesser known band like called Psychofunkopus. Okay, interesting was, name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of wacky wacky shit but like um they were all um really like it, it, living in sacramento this was like a like primus was from the bay area mm -hmm. and all those bands had um you know the bass player was was the the guy like it was like you know it wasn't in the lead guitar player like it used to be it was like wow the bass player um so that also kind of like pushed me in that direction i think you know like less claypool i would say also mm -hmm. so yeah also kind of you know whatever a little like a little embarrassing now but um could be worse like I'd say <laughs> less claypool i'd say less claypool was a pretty big part of my my like like starting to be a serious bass player nice yeah, so the, so the <laughs> T tell us a bit more about the first band then what 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 went down in the first uh, band it was oh god again it was god the 90s were just so embarrassing for me um, <laughs> <laughs> no need to be embarrassed man um, yeah 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 okay cool cool yeah we all had our our early teenage you know whatever um finding ourselves with stuff um the i don't remember the name of the band but it was just two guys from high school. I have a demo tape that we we made actually I listened to recently, and it's just um it was just shreddy, like kind of like wannabe primus rush, 
mm-hmm. like kind of prog rocky ish is like what we were trying um trying to do um and that was the first serious band i was in i want to say the name of the band fuck i don't know if you need to put this in the podcast you can but if not that would be cool um <laughs> The name the name of the band was Monkus. Monkus, nice. Yeah. Strong man. What was the what was the first gig then? And first gig was just like some open mic in Sacramento. There was like a bunch of little cafes that did like three dollars for three bands or like open mic nights. Um 1994 or something like that, 93. Mm-hmm. Um But then I can tell you, I kind of moved into a more, what I would say is more interesting and more, more like where I ended up now. Um, Mm -hmm. Something I'm more, you know, have like, I don't know. Uh, Yeah. The more interesting part of my musical life happened shortly after that. Um, I, uh, it was like, that's when I got into like kind of hardcore and punk music. Um, so that was when I was like probably 17, I guess. I still in high school. And you know, I had at the up until this point, I had like long hair. I even like liked fucking jam bands and shit like that. You know, it was really just really like the worst, um worst, worst of the worst stuff, right? Um, but like I I I met somebody in Sacramento. Um just at a cafe it was this dude his, his name was Kendon and um we it was actually funny because it was kind of like an open jam little situation but it was but <clears throat> he was very much not anything like a hippie or anything like he was you know he was he was what we call consider like a punk I guess and and he came in and we played together and it was like he was just the coolest first of all he was the coolest dude I ever saw like in my life probably until that point just the way he was dressed and stuff um um and so and and we also played and it was actually really kind of fun to play together and he noticed that too it was weird it was almost like cosmic like pushing me in the direction of like you know get out of this like where you were supposed to go yeah where i was supposed to go you know and um and then me so yeah so i, I after i met kendon i really like just was like changed my life up you know it was like I kind of became straight edge ish for a little while um and was a punk and was just and just started hanging out with like you know other you know like like in downtown Sacramento which is very small but like um there was like a a really nice punk scene in the mid 90s and so through that little jam session with Kendon it, it kind of opened that door and I seriously never like looked back after that, you know, like to the other stuff that I was just talking about. Like, you know, I was like, I just totally got into it. And um, and yeah, and you and you know, I was really it's just like one of those weird things where it was like Kendon showed up at that place and it was like, you know, we were just kind of jamming on instruments. It's like it was who I could have not, you know, it's like all those little instances in your life where it's like, you know you still you still connected with kendo a little bit um a little bit on facebook of course (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) what um i'm I'm super intrigued now then so what sort of what really sort of spawned off the back of that relationship in terms of like what kind of what unfolded from there and what you know obviously you you, you took it you you sort of took a different path i guess sonically (laughs) attitude whatever yeah, it was a real strong about like split in the road there. Yeah, like you're talking about um, where I went. I just like got super into like what was going on in the local DIY punk scene um, and stopped caring, you know, and it's like stopped caring about technical music, like practicing, you know, it was like, you know, it was punk. It was more like it wasn't. Anarchistic. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It was like just yeah so so um yeah my interest just started to go that way um 
Wait, what was the question? You were just saying. Well, that. yeah, like what what sort of unfolded after that then? So obviously you've oh, had right. this like you've had this like not necessarily like epiphany, but you've obviously like re reinvented yourself for the better, exactly. feeling a lot more in at home. Like yeah, exactly. What, what what evolved after that in terms of like did did you join any future bands? Um, I really I did, and this is another real um quintess quintessential part of my of my story is that I joined. And then after I met Kendon, I was around and kind of like the most popular punk band in Sacramento, mm -hmm. kind of, but they were, um, it wasn't like popular. They, like, they were just like very under, like very DIY space underground popular, or they were well-respected. Not a, like a lot, like we, we could still play like house parties. But anyways, the name of the band was the Yamos. Okay yeah and um and i they their bass player quit and this is funny oh, actually this was actually the first are you get yeah so i was so their bass player quit so i was gonna play bass for the yamos to begin with or i was gonna try out at least there was like people that wanted to like try out because they were that that kind of well respected at the time and and we just jived super well you know with the first rehearsals and stuff and then James, the bass player, decided that he didn't want to quit and he wanted to come back after I was, you know, I don't know. It's like maybe, yeah. After you were, after you were brought on, brought on you, were, you were tapped onto the field. Yeah, exactly. It's like, <laughs> wait a sec. Oh, no. You know, like I thought you guys would just break up maybe. I don't know. But like, um, or no, I don't, I don't know. But anyways, for whatever reason, James decided he didn't want to quit. He wanted to come back, which was great, um, actually, because because the band wanted me to stay and just play guitar so we had two guitar players so we ended up having two guitar players because i guess they always wanted to have two guitar players anyway and and so they were like yeah sure okay like james is coming back you just move to guitar so then we'll have two guitars and yeah and i stayed in the band and it was the best one like it, like i can highly recommend checking out the yamos i don't know who unfortunately i feel like it never got captured in the way it should have you know on record um mm -hmm. there's one seven inch called off your parents that's just like total classic but i just happened to be in like this sick ass punk band like right off the bat it was amazing it was like um i, I would say, say i want to say even the best band i might have ever been in um yeah bold statements bold statements. <laughs> i know i know i know but it was it was like i and really loved it did you say that was the that was connected through the relationship with kendon totally yeah and that was because like you met him you veered off and then you started sort of mixing in different circles basically <laughs> exactly 100%. got it how long were you in the yamos for then yamos lasted about two years while i was in the band so right through you know 17 to like 19 years old and during the time when you know it was like I was finishing my high school and um moving out of my parents and um you know just like yeah I was in the band and we 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 toured a lot actually um and it was the type of time during the 90s touring was a lot different um it was a lot you know you bought like uh you somehow bought a van for you know 500 bucks um like an econo line van super you know just like piece of shit that always never survived you know more than one or at best two tours yeah um but and you just like ditched it or like you know whatever but it was that kind of touring we would buy one like pay 500 bucks get an econo line van um and tour up and down the west coast and play a lot in um in like diy spaces like basements and small punk clubs and stuff like that and yeah i don't know it was just it's like so, it was so different the 90s you know pre you know every pre-internet everything whatever the way that you tour and the way that things got known there was in, in the Northwest, there was a big uh, indie scene, um, you know, like, especially in Olympia, Washington, 
Um, I don't how know. If far, you know. How far north is that? It's like ten hour drive from Sacramento. Sacramento, south of LA or north of LA? North of LA. It's dead. Yeah. dead is, it, is it as far up as Oakland? Yes, very close. It's about right. about an hour from Oakland. S- south of right. Oakland. East. East. Okay, got it. I thought it was north, but I was just trying to get my geography set. I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah." Nobody really knows Sacramento. Uh, what was the What was the vibe like? I, I'd imagine those touring years and the style of venues that you play in. Yeah, man. Were just probably fucking raucous. Yeah, it was raw as fuck. Um, you know, punk houses. Like, I don't know if that's still a, like if that that so I mean, it must you know but it must still be a thing but like i don't know if that's so, that like culture of like you know buying a big like kind of old frat house and it just being like a punk house you know there was lots of we there was lots of punk houses that we would stay at and or play at play shows at yeah um, all up the west coast um and you know we would you know stop an hour outside of the you know city and like you know, we had this like thing that where you didn't have to pay for the payphone. You could like, it was a di- like it had somehow like you could you could like you know um, free calls, free calls with a payphone. Like there was this little <laughs> thing. I don't know how the hell it worked, but we that's would amazing. do that. That's how like, that's how like you know yeah that's how we were we were living then. Yeah, um, but like you know, you compare that to a world of a world of now where like most people, not everybody, but most people in the world have a mobile phone. You know, oh my God. all the deals are like you know, and limited calls that are, you know you're not even sort of tracking, you're not even tracking how much calls cost now. Whereas back then it was like I don't know a quarter or a dime, whatever it was. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you, you know, you made that one call like an hour before, and then you had your map and everything. Like you had to figure out. Yeah, how to actually get that? that you know, um, and you know, yeah. So yeah, that was that was sort of how that was and i mean luckily yeah yeah all the like we we just played really fun it was so fun though but that's that's why i don't know when i say it was the best band i mean it was like musically there was there was like especially the main songwriter guy he he was like super super talented total genius but you know that's like i don't know if you want to put this podcast but like maybe the type that's like a little too smart for his own good and so he couldn't kind of get out of Sacramento. Right. Okay. Uh, and he's still there and just kind of like, I don't know, doing his thing. Um, but anyways, musically, it was, it was like pretty special. It was very, very special too. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we, we, we did that. We did that. Like I was very involved in the DIY punk scene in the nineties, late nineties. Nice. So what? So what? What? What involved after that? Obviously, that you said the band ran for two years. Like, what was? The, yeah, and then what was the, what was the next step? Total, just you know, young guys in a band stuff. Like everybody, you know, it, there was no there was no physical fighting, I guess. But like, it got it got like that, you know, just stupid ego stuff. Mm-hmm. And we broke up, and right after that, me and the singer who um you know who is the singer now of chick the band chick 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 or three exclamation points mm-hmm. um we after the after the almost broke up both of us decided to hitchhike um around we hitchhiked first around the united states like made our way over to new york what was that yeah that was this was before the europe trip okay so yeah like right after that the almost broke up we just were like fuck it and we like literally like hitchhiked and hopped on freight trains like fucking you know fucking wanna be we might need a we might need a whole we might need a whole podcast for this but yeah it could it could it could be it it could be if we can try if i wasn't expecting this but if we can boil this down yeah um what what were like what was the the like i don't know the sort of the best and the the best one thing and the best worst not not the best worst thing but the best thing and yeah, the, the worst, worst thing about worst that, thing that, that trip yeah. story <laughs> um <laughs> stuff that you're willing to share obviously yeah yeah god um I mean just hopping on the freight trains is enough like yeah man like the freight train thing was fucking insanity 
I can't believe I did that now. You know, it's like as an older, if, I mean, you know, it was, it was incredible. It's incredibly dangerous. Thing, yeah. You know? And what were you um, doing though? Were you finding like, were you like waiting till at night and hopping on? You would, once, were you being tactical about it or like, where were you picking? Where were you jumping on? As, you... as much as I guess we could be at the time, which yeah. was just one of us. It was me and the singer, Chick, uh, Nick. Uh, Nick, 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 we call him. Um, and two of our, our his girlfriend and my girlfriend, actually. And we we would just in the night, like, go to the, the yards and ask the switchers, like, hey, like, and, and hope that one of the switchers was, like, kind of a kind sort of sort of dude um, that would tell us tell us the truth of what was going on. You know, like, this this train here on that track is going to go towards whatever um and i never did that it was always I, the, the girls like would do that our girlfriends would actually always do that because i guess go, like, go, go and find the info out go and find yeah the they info. might yeah they might be you know the guy might be a little more sympathetic to them so um so they would go find the info out and and we would yeah just go off that off of what the switchers would tell us and um it, it lots of times didn't it didn't it was not like it, it was not that easy like <laughs> it's it's in, it all, i think things always sound like they're easy to do when you say it say yeah. it into words but then when you actually go and do it in practice yeah yeah exactly things are different right so i'm just even just trying to imagine doing it myself i'm like there was a, yeah there was a whole culture of it in the united states in the yeah. late 90s like punks that would hop freight trains crazy yeah um and you know sometimes like so we went north first and then we headed east and you know it would take like an a, a trip that would take like you know 10 hours or or something on it like to portland could end up taking a day and a half because you know with the freight trains they Stop like it, of course and they, you know it's like not um so you know you were just chilling on the spot like on a box car you know <laughs> <laughs> keeping yourselves entertained for okay, straight chilling what um okay so what yeah what i guess what happened Let's move on from the from the the freight trains. Like I said, that yeah. could be another, another episode in itself. But yeah. um, you said that took you all the way to New York. Was that the sort of end destination, essentially? Yeah, we wanted to go. To, we wanted to get to New York. You know, um, I had no plan. We I don't think we had any plan of moving there yet. But we we did. We made it to New York. Also hitchhiking, which was probably even more sketchy and dangerous um, at the time. But we made it to New York and totally we stayed there for two weeks and really, you know, fell in love with with it then. This was 98, 90, 97, I think. Mm -hmm. um, very different, you know, city than it is now. And it was kind of it was sort of more, you know, switching over to being this more like fancy gentrified thing from like what it was in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, it's just like it felt like it was so fucking right. It was just like, we we're blown away, like how much we loved it there. Mm -hmm. They on Ludlow Street um, in the Lower East Side. And it was like, yeah, it was just like the best thing ever. Um, so we, that, that's when we, you know, hatched the plan to move from Sacramento to, to New York. Got it. So when did you actually make, when did you actually make the move then? Yeah, man. So then we, okay. So after this, that like, that's when, okay, so after that trip, during the trip is when I guess we decided to start the, with Chick Chick Chick, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to start that band. And um, and when we got back, we did that, and we just kind of collected our friends that, um, you know, Sacramento, small, like, you know, punk musicians that we kind of, like, wanted to start something that would be like a dance band, you know, like play dance music at hardcore shows when this was very we were the only ones fucking doing that shit you know i was i was gonna say that's like in the late 90s like now it's ubiquitous that everybody like you know oh, yeah, yeah then it was like like very segregated like dance music you know punk like punk bands band. yeah yeah no crossover whatsoever and and we decided to do that 
Nick, Nick was really inspired. I mean, it was his idea and it was a, it was a brilliant sort of move for us to do that. So post Yamos, we started Chick Chick Chick, started touring around again in the same kind of way mm -hmm. um, with Chick 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 and playing these like punk shows, you know, where with the, with the new with emo or like emo and so at that at that point, I guess you made an effort to to make the music more danceable, right? In terms of like that's right the the sound itself. Yeah. Um, so what was the, what was the what was the reaction like when you were first doing those gigs then? Because obviously you were like was... this was something like something kind of unheard of right. in a space that's not really. I don't want to say that not dance music wasn't accepted, but it just wasn't. Oh, no. the norm. It, it um, totally was. It was very. What was the what was the, what was the reaction like? um we it wasn't like fully it was it was fun it, it it wasn't like ever like hostile or anything i would say like people like throwing bottles or some shit like you know like you might think but like um it was a little you know mixed it wasn't we weren't like super well received at first but we definitely um started started to kind of build something um mm. from that from that and from that no notoriety of being this band that did that um and yeah then from there chick 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 it sort of started to build um popularity wise i guess you know we were still very much in the diy scene and you know still playing these kind of like you know basements and, and punk spaces punk diy spaces but like um, but yeah, we started to get more popular um, between like, yeah, 90, 98, 99. Um, and then we managed to get a record deal. Like we got record deals, you know, like like people would ask us to put out records, which was like, you know, it was like a big, a big deal for us at the time. Like somebody wanted to, you know, put us to put out a record. And, and proper. Um, and... <clears throat> And so, yeah, we did that. And, and I, I just need to mention quickly also that we, I, at the same time, I was still really into, I was I was very into experimental and like dub music at the time too. So I also had like a, another project called Out Hub mm -hmm. was the name of the band. And we were kind of doing stuff simultaneously. Like Out Hub was playing shows, um, was playing shows like maybe opening up for Chick-Chick, but we were doing more like instrumental a little more experimental um type of stuff and then while chicky chick was like kind of the slightly bigger band um <clears throat> i just wanted to mention out hype because yeah it was also kind of a big thing at this time so i was playing a lot though i was touring a lot with lots of bands um and then we made our way after after the um about you know after the trip and being so impressed with new york we like did it. We were just like Sacramento was just. I mean, Sacramento was just horror, like horrible place to be somebody that you know. If you want, if you're a kid and you want something, right? You want, it, it, you want like stimulation. It's like you you kind of. It's a fucking cow town in a way, you know. Um, and you know, some people are cool with that, and I have friends there that are just fine, just like you know, like whatever, just chilling you know like not really like you know it's a nice place to just chill right it's very like nice people and melt you know like california sort of vibe but it was like super boring and we just decided all together as a band as chick 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 we're like let's just move to new york let's like relocate to new york as a band and in late 99 early 2000 um yeah we made the move from sacramento to new york and then that's we just like just happened to find a nice you know lofty like really raw loft space in south williamsburg and we moved in there um it was raw as fuck it was like south williamsburg like in the hasidic area there you know like but you know we we're at that age you don't give a shit you're just like whatever there's like rats crawling in the ceiling and whatever like you know <laughs> like a cock like the cockroaches fucking like scattering when you turn lights <laughs> on but like yeah it's like yeah whatever just kind of classic but you're just like you don't give up yeah you're just like go out and have fun and then like come home and like 
drink whatever and then pass out <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, yeah. what, what how, like i guess what, what i guess how did everything sort of transition and how did you kind of get involved with lcd then um i'm assuming yeah. that it happened in that sort of same time period basically. yeah not long after for sure yeah. well yeah so the williamsburg scene it was actually kind of like a, a like you know like a scene like people knew each other and there was like everybody there was a lot of bands that were had the same feeling we did and moved to new york there was a lot of bands in new york at that time um mm -hmm. doing their thing and you know it was pre-internet so there wasn't a lot of stupid oh like blown out overhype about it but it was just this kind of cool thing in Williamsburg at the time um and anyways James put out Losing My Edge in 2003 and he got offered since it had you know it was this so he he like a lot of people credit him and like that as like the beginning of when you know dance and rock at that time you know, of course that already 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 happened in the 80s but like when it like happened in the way we it is now like losing my edge was like probably one of the first things that people would say even though chick to chick we had been doing it it was just kind of like we were on the same same wavelength same wavelength from you know um coming from very different places but yeah um so i was already really familiar with that like thing of you know being a be, like having a punk ish or like raw like approach and um being able to play like with like like groove groove type music mm -hmm. which yeah and that wasn't really that was not very not common then too um even though it wasn't like i was technically you know some crazy dude but like just having that combination of things was unique and James saw this band that the other band that I was playing with Outhud <clears throat> and Outhud I switched between guitar and bass we, we would like do this like 90s thing where they would where everybody would switch instruments all the time I don't know if you're, <laughs> you're like no, I, I wasn't aware of that that's pretty yeah it was like pretty... a trend in the 90s man it was funny <clears throat> Like we could like beat happening or like tortoise or like and he's like like you know one song one dude would play drums and the other one play you know so we would do that anyways i was playing bass at a show without hud and james saw us play at that show i remember the show pretty vividly it was like it was a weirdly like great show and i like at the end just kept playing the rest of the band left the stage and me and the the guy who we had a guy who was like dubbing live we just kept jamming and it was like i never we never do that and um and it just like hit super hard that night and james happened to be there and he, i guess he was really impressed with the with my bass playing and he was just like you know i want that bass player in my band and, and at the you know he he didn't even think it was going to be like a serious band he just thought he was looking for people to play to kind of like um you know cap like capitalize i guess you could say on the hype of of losing my edge and and so he asked me to be in the band then yeah this is like yeah 2003 from like, the from the from, from the jump from the jump man yeah after lo like losing my edge just came out you know I, oh, everybody's freaking out especially in the uk you know it was like a really big deal and um and I could already tell, you know, there wasn't a lot of like money and stuff yet, of course. Um, or like, it wasn't real cushy. I mean, it was still kind of, you know, we we're still starting from the beginning, but I could already tell that it was going to be, you know, I don't know, James just had this aura. He had that thing of like somebody important, right? So it was just kind of like, oh, James asked me to be in the band. Whoa, like it was like a big deal, you know, it was like, even though he only put out this one single and and you know you could you could just tell that it was going to be something i guess and um uh, and then that's when yeah 2003 started playing with lcd then um and the yeah, first show was in, in london at what was the i think it's called the andes hotel now and oh the end yeah no not at the no, end 
Sorry, what did you say? It was, was that a hotel? It used to be called. It was in East London by Liverpool Street. It, it, I think it's called the Andes now. It used to be called. Oh, what the fuck was the name of it? Um, it's like a really fancy hotel there, and they and they did parties in the early mid two thousands. Like, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish I really wish I knew because we would. Yeah, I can't. I can't remember. There. It was like a fucking really nice like five star hotel in that part of London. Mm -hmm. fancy it was the first, uh, first time i ever you know stayed in my own hotel room when we played that gig you know they gave us our own hotel rooms so that was like i think that was our payment was like the hotel rooms you know it was like but i was you know i don't know if you remember like like touring and actually not having to share a room with people it was just yeah like, yeah yeah it's like a you, you've leveled up it was yeah man that yeah, was I, like i made it yeah i was <laughs> i was like i was very sold you could say oh. LCD's first gig or your first gig with LCD. That was LCD's very first gig. Wow! It was, uh, it was called Return, Return to New York. Yeah, and it was at the the name of the hotel. Well, but it, I think it's called the Andes now. Um, it was there, and Arthur Baker actually put the the gig on. Amazing. Yeah, so I was like, hey, we were hanging with Arthur Baker too when we got there. It was really fucking random. Wow. Um, yeah and um we played with too many djs and errol and us live we were the only band um, that was like yeah that would that would have been like you know peak peak lineup for that era right but yeah As, but it was still a little before it was, like it was before a, everything kind of blew up really yeah for sure for sure um um yeah so that that was that was our um you know I'm, I'm i'm actually like looking for the name of the hotel because it's bothering me now but i'll i'll figure it out later because it was but it was in yeah in the big lobby there yeah it was it was uh i i think there's actually footage of it now and it's in that documentary meet it's called meet me in the bathroom um mm -hmm. it's uh you know that it's like a uh, it's about th that time in New York and the rock, like what I'm talking about, like the rock scene. But yeah, we played that return to New York party. That was our first thing. And then the next night we played it, we played at the end the next night for trap with that trash. For Errol's night, right? For Errol's night. Yeah, exactly. We did like a really like stripped down, you know, um, just version of it. I think we played like three or like four or five songs. No, yeah, nobody had heard, like really known too much about us at the point but at that point but you know yeah it was really like and also so and then, then that was like that was the first time i saw errol dj and then that started that was pretty formative also too many djs like at that night that first like i i was actually like kind of blown away because i'd never being from the states you know still at that point house music was like i liked it but it's like i i had like it was hard, far and few between to get good club experiences with a lot of people, like cool people into it. Plus the DJs just fucking banging it out and like being really eclectic. So I was really like that, that, that seeing them DJ at those, at that first, out those LCD shows, like kind of also like really like ramped up my, you know, desire to make electronic and be a DJ, I guess. Yeah yeah very formative um i'm just conscious of time just to just to do a quick pause but how much longer have you got before you need to chat 20 minutes okay cool yeah, yeah well i think an hour would probably be about sort of 10 minutes roughly from now so let's let's try and roll for another 50 okay cool um so i'm just yeah i'm just trying to think of the best way now because we, we we're just getting to the the lcd part yeah and then, uh -huh that's that's yeah there's a there's a lot to talk about there but i'm conscious we still need to obviously talk about um your label mm -hmm. um right okay so obviously you're you're kind of you know your first gig in with lcd in london obviously there's been um an epic ride over the last was it 20 years the or was it 20 years the gig. 20 years there yeah recently 20 years when the yeah the, the, the gigs at the end of last year in london mm -hmm. like 
obviously there's a lot to cover in that time frame. Um, mm. I mean, can you just give us your top three kind of highlights from that time period? Because I feel like we could we could do another two hours on that, and then another hour on the freight trains. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. top top three moments for you, I guess, with LCD. Um, with LCD, um, I uh, there was man, yeah, there was a lot of funny, just crazy shit. Um, I I mean there was there was some really special feeling shows where I mean the top moments are the show those like few shows we play a lot of fucking shows but it's like you know there's a handful maybe even that are like where it feels like almost cosmically everybody's like on the same but like vibrate like vibration that's at least how it feels for me I don't know other people might be like whatever that's like kind of some you know hippie grateful dead shit or something i don't know but like but uh or i don't know um maybe not but for me like you know like those mo the, the best the best things are like when the, those shows that are like kind of like weirdly magically special um but you know we played we played so many cool festivals we opened up for slayer actually at a festival Amazing. you know which was pretty like hit huge you know um that was fun that was in france um you know we lots of just playing with lots of iconic bands that we you know grew up listening to um you know standing in line we, we played fuji rock festival and like to get our my passport stamped i actually stand stood in line behind les claypool you know yeah. which was like i was like i actually didn't even i was too freaked out to even say anything i was like so oh, no way. you were yeah, just like yeah. basking basking in the moment yeah, I was just like, oh my fucking god! Like, I didn't think I would be so so starstruck, but Les Claypool really like was one of the few that's like did that for me. Um, um, yeah, so yeah, playing Fuji Rock, you know, yeah, traveling to Japan, um, and then you know, like as far as shows go, like yeah, we did the fucking like break up the band Madison Square Garden show. That was, I would say, that could that was like. A pretty much a high point you up, know up there yeah i was up there that was very up there um, big, big old big old space right yeah yeah it was a fun, yeah yeah man i don't even know twenty five thousand something uh, people yeah and it was sold out and um it was it was yeah it was bonkers i yeah it, it was surreal um and, and another thing is that we played really well you know it was like which was fun. It was like we this massive fucking place, and I felt like we were like kind of killed it, you know. Which was just, it was really fun. Amazing. Yeah. And then what about the um? Like I guess how did the how did the anniversary shows kind of like come about? And I guess to go from I guess breaking up the band to to getting back together, like sort of how did that how did that all come about? And 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 how did that sort of fold into the anniversary? Is that is that all in the one same thing or? yeah right. yeah you know after about what it was it, six or seven years of, of of the band you know being you know broken up like really like i didn't even think james was gonna i i didn't people think it was a big plan you know to whatever but i literally thought we were done you know so i was just here in berlin had had kids you know and for like six or seven years after that breakup until our for until we reun reunited i was just here um being you know being dad and kind of freaking out about like what am I going to do you know with the, with my life now um and then you know James I never really talked to him too much you know though I don't think I think he just he just felt inspired to do it again you know like he really just felt inspired um and and was like fuck it and I was like hell yeah that's great you know like <laughs> of course like you know I mean like I did I was like having this existential like crisis and so of course I was but also I was just like yes like let's fucking get back together and piss everybody off by getting back together you know <laughs> I was so I was so down for it you know because it was just at the time when you know everything was going to shit with like music sales and everybody was streaming and I felt a, you know maybe I felt a little bit um you know resentful towards the whole industry of people listening to music for free 
so I was just like, fuck, fuck y'all, you know, like, yeah, yeah the punk, the punk, the punk sort of DNA. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah, you want to get mad at us fucking getting back together or whatever and call it a cash grab? Like, dude, fucking pay for our music, you know? Let's go, let's go. Yeah, yeah. So I was all for it. I was all for the like piss everybody off and get back together um, on different levels. And and so, yeah, that was, yeah, 2016. I think we had Lion Coachella, which was weird. Um, a nice comeback gig. Yeah, yeah, we have a good booking agent. She really like, she she kind of like strong armed our way. I mean, it you know it was like us one night and, um, actually fucking Guns and Roses the next night, which wow. is another yeah yeah full circle. If I if I would have known you know as a twelve a ten year old, you know, that I would be the same playing on the two thing. the two string guitar. Yeah, exactly. Wanting to learn Paradise City and like you know really you know trying my hardest to play paradise city like that you know that many years later we would be yeah basically sharing the same billing as guns and roses um but yeah we play coachella and then that's when the whole yeah like now we're you know we're active again um and very you know yeah so that 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 was that was how all that kind of went down it was just yeah james i really really do think i think he was just like no, I want to do this again. And you know what, actually, and I think he said this in an interview, so it's not like some, he actually got advice from from none other than David Bowie, no um, before David Bowie had died, to um, to do it, to get the band back together. Really? So like, well, or just to like do... His, 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 last, his last words. I know, right? LCD. <laughs> Can you imagine? On his, de- on his deathbed. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We, I mean... Yeah, let's make that the headline. I had to. Yeah. um that's super cool no, it was like it was just sort of like it was before because james worked with him and it was it was before actually he, i think he came out with he had he had the cancer and mm-hmm. and they were still just friends and david bowie just said something like if it feels uncomfortable to you you should definitely do it you know that's like the way you should that's the where you need to be as an artist and that inspired james to to do it nice but so but m- m- with my understanding you started your own label around 2016 that's right yeah after james gave the word that we were doing this um i was like i i had kind of um you know i i had the inkling of an idea to do it not real strong impetus but then knowing that yeah okay we're going to do this and i'll have some money you know to 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 do it because you know at this point making doing a label is not making money it's just i don't know what it is but it's just putting stuff out there you know that you like and 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 um and this band a band from sacramento had contacted me one of the the guy from the yamos i was telling you about that i i, I really respected mm-hmm. his he had a new band and i was like they contacted me and I was like, I was just like, it just felt really right. You know, I was just like, yeah, would you guys mind being the first release on my label? And I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea how to do this, but I'm figuring it out. But like, I'm down to put money and whatever I can into this. And so we we did it. And it, there's this band called the Dr- Drug Apartments um, from Sacramento. And, you know, they're kind of an arty punk band. And that was the first release on Interference Pattern at that. And, and that was, yeah, around this, you know, LCD re, uh, you know, reunited time. And that's when Interference Pattern kind of kicked off at yeah, 2016. And it was just, a, yeah, it was just like, you know, like with Facebook, Facebook, man, fucking, you know, so many, now so many of these stories are like, you know, eventually lead back to Facebook um, or whatever, social media. But it was like he, yeah, they contacted me on Facebook and was just like, and I and 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 I was just like, you know, I love what Tristan Tristan the guitar player does always. So I was just like, even before I heard it, I was just like, I'm starting a label. Do you guys maybe want to put it out? You know, I was like, just Dang. wanted, to, yeah, you wanted, to support. wanted to, yeah, I just wanted the support. Like into it was like a no brain. It was like just no very intuitive like didn't give it much thought mm-hmm. 
and that's how that's how it kind of started that's how i figured it out i mean i didn't do you know fucking a i was just like what am i like i don't even know what to i don't I have no idea what to do here right i'm just on a label now right and um and i kind of started to slowly figure it out from there um yeah with that drug apartments release and then yeah and then and then do you want me to tell you a little more about yeah that? i guess like how the yeah how the you know i guess like you're you put like a mix of different stuff out on the label yeah um you know obviously your own stuff as well as more kind of like music kind of from where you originally started in the kind of punk scene i guess or yeah. you know, closer to that sound yeah uh, and then obviously something you know a lot more kind of pop and r&b with like edge layer so a real kind of like very sort of sound palette um yeah yeah it ended up being that way um i guess like i said before I, it's kind of true true to the name right like kind of that's uh, exactly yeah, like yeah it's yeah. not necessarily tunnel vision you know I, yeah exactly man and i never really i never i hadn't put that together until you, you you pointed it out but it's funny how you think of these things almost subconsciously um but yeah it was like you know I didn't have a real set plan besides what feels right mm -hmm. for me, you know, which I still feel about the label. Um, and, you know, that's led to a pretty like diverse sort of thing. Um, and I don't, I'm, I'm very cool. You know, like you've worked with me. Like I'm, I'm pretty chill. Like, I'm just like, do your thing. You know, I'm not like this type of label guy. I was like, mm, it doesn't fit with the set. Like, can you take this sound out or some bullshit like that? You know, it's like, I'm there to be like almost like a enthusiastic, you know, parent, yes. like a parent or something, or like support the artist, like, yeah, let's do this. Fucking great, fucking great. I mean, and you know, luckily I work I've been working with people that I really truly feel that way with with, you know, like with Edge and with and I, you know, I did that one release with time I did a time cow um, you know, before Equinox was pretty like as as established as they are now. Um got in touch with time cow through instagram i was following him nobody followed him and i was like liking all of his stuff and he was like who are you dude like you're like weirdo you know and i was just like dude i'm a fucking massive time cow fan you know mm -hmm. and so uh yeah the time cow record came about from that Amazing. And, and and instagram also with edge you know it was like same like she because she had put a record out and it was very dark and experimental. Her very first EP, very, very different from what I just released, the Serena um, LP. It was, I don't know if you've heard her first one, but it's like, it's fucking weird as fuck. Yeah, you know? I think I think I did. I did look back at her catalog and yeah, some of her, like there's obviously, there's a, definitely a progression there in the sound. It's crazy. It was dope. You know, it was really yeah. dope, but it was, it was experiment. It was like not pop. It was, ex it was like very experimental. And <clears throat> anyways i just i wasn't hearing about her and so i, I contacted her also on um, instagram and just was like what's going on and then she's like i have these new songs and then and then it was the same sort of thing where i just intuitively was like would you want to release on, on my label you know i have a label like yeah i didn't you know it just felt like the thing i wanted to do because i like was a, a fan you know yeah, yeah, yeah. um and and then you know that relationship started with edge then that was probably yeah 2018 or something like that um and yeah man yeah so all the did, way up, all, all the way up to your your recent release as well back in back in december that's right yeah yeah and then, um, yeah, yeah that, that a lot kind of, you know some of the releases whatever you know kind of just slowly but surely kind of just working on the label so, so I mean, I guess from your own, as a, as a, as your own, as an artist in your own right, like where, like, what do you see? What are you working on next, or do you, you know, where you want to go with it, or are you just kind of right. as it comes. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I got my next EP ready, not ready, but um, it's being like one of the tracks is being sort of mixed. I always work. I don't mix my stuff myself. I, I have other people mix it. Um. I'm just, um, you know, I'm not a very good, like, technical engineer type. Um, and I like my stuff to sound engineered properly. So I'm working with somebody. And actually, today, he's going to send me 
what will be the first version of the first song for the next EP of mine. Um, and then I have two others ready to go to. Um, so the next EP will be hopefully in the next like three or four months. Like, so you got, yeah, you kind of, you're, you're sort of building up a nice pipeline of your own stuff that you can, you can kind yeah. of. Yeah. And right now I'm going to focus a little bit on, on that um, rather than trying to kind of stat, like grow the artist, grow the label with different artists or any, any or, or something like that. Like, yeah, just, you know, I mean, like running a label is just, it's a lot of money. It takes a lot of money. And, um, you know, I was doing LCD and we we're touring a lot. It was a little more, you know, flush with cash at the time, but now it's like, I don't know my life circumstances change. I just don't have as much to kind of like do, you know, stuff for the love of it, you know, as I used to, but it'll still work. And um, so now, but, but for now, I'm just going to basically focus on my own projects nice. for a, maybe for the next year, even like, unless something spectacular comes my way that I'm like, oh, I should, I really need to do this um I, I, it'll be mostly me and maybe me and like collaborating with somebody project for the next year nice yeah and obviously you've got some you got some some uh hot new clothes clothing drop in as well in the next couple of months yeah man working with your man lenny over in new york tell us about tell us briefly about your relationship with lenny and how you kind of i guess sure obviously he's based, he's based in new york but yeah tell us a bit about lenny <laughs> super yeah super random again man my friend so i gotta give a shout out to my friend theo um he uh is a good friend of mine in new york who also uh, during all those years was like you know a friend and i want to maybe even a little bit of like a mentor like even though theo kind of probably knows less about certain things he really has a very he's like just really strong-minded artist person like person um he um introduced me to lenny oh, cool. and it was it was totally just it wasn't like theo was a, like a fan of lenny per se it was just that it was like he knew somebody that knew that knew lenny and yeah. the person that he knew like gave a high recommendation of lenny and i was like okay you know check it out and we met, yeah, probably 2018, 17. And, um, and, you know, at first I was like, I was still thinking about it, like wanting to keep a little bit of the punk aesthetic and, and, and you know, Lenny like went to, you know, all these schools, you can tell he's like a very trained graphic designer. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know, but you know, like the more time goes on and the and, like the more I just, I like, I'm so glad I I chose that like chose to work with him and he's just a fucking great really smart dude who's also incredibly chill which is just a total you know um yeah it's it's not easy to find in this in the yeah good way good way of working yeah lots of people oh have, that have, have that temperament right I don't even know it's it's he's, he blows my mind yeah he's like very patient but still on the ball you know and he does great stuff and he and so anyways yeah he designed the logo for the label he does all the graphic design he does my record covers and yeah now we're going to be dropping these tees that he designed um which i'm you know very psyched about um, and yeah hopefully hopefully we'll be able to get him on the next podcast so we can uh we can continue yeah. the story, man. yeah man the ask story. him what's up like with his his you know his journey like he yeah he he's a he's, he was born and raised in new york so he just kind of you know inherently like has a good sense of things like of, of what i like and, and like has great taste um on a lot of different very broad you know yeah a lot of different spectrum sort of thing yeah but he seems like he just like fell right into it with like like what he thought the aesthetic of the label could be and um yeah so I'm just yeah been working with Lenny since then and and he and you know yeah hopefully we keep working together I'm I'm really lucky yeah I feel really lucky in that in that way 
Nice. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think I think that's a pretty good time to, to wrap it up. I think we could Great. definitely do about another two, three, or four hours on. Oh my god, dude! I'm like we, ba- we barely we barely scratched the surface with LCD. I didn't. And even, then I was. I like, maybe was. It was. Er- it's early morning coffee coffee chat time. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's like the early day. So. Well, we can we can definitely do a part two. So don't worry about that. Um, yeah. So yeah any, we're any... talk about all the, you know, like you were talking about like the spank rock. Yeah, living next to the guys. Like, exactly. I mean, yeah. that's a good little that's a good little teaser to get everyone excited about the next one. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think look, is there any like I don't know parting words, shout outs, or anything that that you yeah, want to just, say before we kind of sign off? Sure, definitely shout out. Like I was I was saying, my friend Theo the other day. Um, you know her her uh, sorry his um at, uh x band made busy you know they were in a band telepathy that i i you know still was like a big influence um shout out to them and shout out to naeem <clears throat> spank rock who also was a big influence and you know um yeah i uh, um shout out to my girlfriend classic um, <laughs> gotta get that one in there <laughs> exactly, yeah no for real she's amazing and 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 we have a band we have a band together right now um oh, nice yeah we're also in the midst of putting something together for release amazing oh what it's going to be called or what but it's it's fun it's fun as fuck and and she's also been very influential for me um you know just of course you know yeah as as like a good you know she's she's dope she's my girlfriend it's like i'm always like running stuff by her and she's got a good she's she doesn't you know yeah big shout out to my girlfriend sarah and do another podcast on her another time man yeah, <laughs> yeah we could talk about our band that we could get into the hearts tentatively tentatively t- titled hearts and minds um ah, cool yeah we can get into that um yeah, it's not not the worst name. Maybe we'll keep it. It's kind of been our working title, um, but that's more like like way more like jammy, experimental, Chris and cozy, you know, kind of vibe. Um, yeah. Cool, man. Well, look, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like thanks for coming on. I'm sure we'll need to do a part two, part three, or part four. But um, yeah. Yeah, man, I think it's good to good to chat it out and and talk through these experiences and uh, yeah, share it with everyone that's that's interested. But yeah, right thanks for your time, man. Word, thanks, dude. Thanks, Later. Matt.